India and Portugal have close relationship. There have been high level engagement. In fact, uh, uh, the prime ministers of both the country had visited each other's country in the year 2017. And now with us is the foreign minister of Portugal to talk about uh, this relationship. So welcome to Vion. And my first and obvious question to you is, how do you see this relationship going forward between India and Portugal? Well, we're very excited about the India-Portugal relationship. As you pointed out, there's an excellent uh, rapport between uh, our prime ministers. They, they know each other well and they have a very good personal relationship. Uh, but uh, the personal relationship between leaders important as it is, has to be built upon a closer relationship between, between peoples, between our um, foreign ministries uh, and different uh, structures. And uh, in that respect, what we're seeing in the past few years is an intensification of interactions at all levels. And uh, Portugal has always uh, been a keen promoter of the EU-India relationship. So we've been also using our position inside the European Union, including our occasional presidency of the rotating presidency of the European Union, to push for this. So uh, at the moment, uh, we are living a very promising phase in the relationship. And my role as foreign minister, I'm very pleased to feel that uh, Minister Jay Shankar feels the same. Uh, is to build upon this and to take the opportunities as they are arising to create a closer interaction between our peoples. And you met with the Indian External Affairs Minister as well. What kind of conversations were there during that, uh, that meeting? And of course, uh, how much there was the mention of what's happening in your part of the world, that is the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Well, uh, I would say that uh, three quarters of our time was dedicated to our bilateral relations, which is indicative of our ambitions and of how much there is to be done in the fields of economics, of culture, of science, uh, mobility. And uh, so we spent a good deal of time talking about what we need to do to create the best circumstances for uh, each of our countries to work more closely with the other. And then, of course, we talked about the wider uh, implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the way that it impacts upon regional security in Europe, the way that it impacts upon global geopolitics, the way that it impacts upon the international order, the United Nations-based international order. And on all of these uh, issues, I uh, felt that it was possible to, to uh, develop with India a very uh, strong shared sense of concern and a uh, shared sense also of what we need to do working together to fix what is being destroyed uh, currently, particularly in the United Nations system, for example. Uh, so you used an interesting phrase using the term ambitious. What ambition do you see for this relationship in terms of practical cooperation between the two countries, uh, in terms of more engagement, whether it's bilaterally or at uh, the multilateral forum as well? I think uh, the, the best definition of our ambition is that it should live up to the high level of personal warmth that have, we have between our leaders. In the future, India, Portugal, both being democracies, will have other leaders um, who maybe do not even know each other. But what is fundamental is that when that happens, that we have a very solid basis of relationship uh, at all levels. And I think that in the fields of science, in the field of education, the field of uh, all of the issues that relate to our young people, uh, the future uh, issues that are increasingly relevant for our world, connectivity, uh, digitalization, the challenges of digitalization, the questions of um, ocean governance and the potentialities of the blue economy. These are all areas in which Portugal and India can work more and more closely together in order for the mutual benefit of, of our populations, of our economy, of our societies. And how much defense is there on the table when it comes to cooperation? I know there was an MOU that was signed previously, but how far both countries are keen to engage on defense cooperation? Well, that's an interesting point. I'm a former defense minister and therefore, uh, of course, uh, very much aware of the defense dimension 
of uh, the relationship. And uh, that was also discussed uh, in, our, in our bilateral meeting, namely the possibility of working on uh, our defense industries, strengthening our defense industries, creating partnerships between our defense industries in the area of aeronautics, in the area of drone technology. So I think that uh, both of us have, um, at the end of the meeting, felt that there was homework to be done. Uh, there are new possibilities. We were able to identify areas that we consider to be of mutual in interest and so shall be returning uh, to, to speak to our uh, economic agents, uh, our uh, institutional structures to say let's get working on these areas because the other side is also interested in this. Mm -hmm. uh, so now going back to Ukraine, you mentioned shared concerns. What kind of shared concerns are there? Because there are divergences when it comes to European view of situation in Ukraine and the Indian view of the situation in Ukraine. So what are these shared concerns basically you're talking about and how do you see India's stance amidst this invasion that has happened in Ukraine? Well, I think the shared concerns are largely re related to the high level of disorder that has been introduced by Russians, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Disorder of the international system, it's an international system based on international law and clearly there has been a, a strong abuse of international law. Uh, there is also a shared concern about uh, the consequences of a very much weakened Russia. It's not, we, we were not in the business uh, before this Russian invasion of Ukraine to uh, be promoting a weakened Russia. But this has been the result that Russia has brought upon itself. And when one thinks about the geopolitical consequences of this for Europe, for India, these are not uh, positive consequences. We would much rather have Russia as a strong and respected uh, partner of the international, in the international sphere. But unfortunately, this is not uh, the case. Also, another shared concern is that with Russia being a permanent member of the Security Council, so one of the anchors of the international system, um, to have uh, that uh, member of the United Nations actually uh, questioning, putting into question the whole structure of international, uh, international order uh, based on the United Nations, this is extremely problematic. We are both very much interested, Portugal, uh, European Union and India interested in uh, functioning United Nations and so I think that one of the things that we're going to have to do together is to work out what manner uh, that we, we can, we can uh, recover something of what has been lost. There's another aspect which has been the result not only of the Russian invasion of Ukraine but before that also of the pandemic which is a sense that uh, globalization has broken down and there is a fragmentation of globalization because globalization happened in a manner in which issues of strategic trust were forgotten. There was a level of international integration uh, which created vulnerabilities that uh, countries in many cases were not uh, paying attention to. Now they're paying a lot of attention to them. So what is fundamental now is that the right balance is found between global integration or international integration which is advantageous for our populations, our societies and strategic trust and with uh, India uh, we in Europe and Portugal think that we have here a partner that we can strategically trust so although the whole situation is actually uh, a very negative one one of the results can be positive which is uh, a deepened sense uh, on both sides that we can actually do a lot more together and we need to do a lot more together. Mm -hmm. But the strategic partner India has close relationship with Moscow as well. Do you see India in an influential role to somehow uh, persuade Moscow to persuade uh, President Putin that this is enough is enough and this is just this just can't go you need to stop somewhere. Do you see India's role in that, in that position in terms of mediation? Well, firstly, I should say that uh, I'm very much aware of the history of Indo-Russian relations, Indo-Soviet relations, uh, practically from independence, Indo-Russian relations in the last 30 years. This is something we fully understand, we fully uh, respect, we know how it developed and uh, this is something that does not disappear from one moment to another. And it's very good that uh, Russia should be listening to views 
uh, from around the world, including from India. Unfortunately, the sense we have at the moment is that Russia is not in listening mode. And if Russia is not in listening mode, there are limits to what any uh, well-intentioned international partner, such as India, can, uh, can achieve. So I would say that at the moment, um, there is a, a platform of mediation that has not been very successful so far, which is provided by Turkey. And we believe that, that it's functioning as far as is possible with current Russian attitudes. What uh, I hope that um, Russia would be available to hear from India is that it uh, really is not in its own interests to continue down this path and that sooner or later it's going to need to opt for a negotiated uh, solution. And I know that uh, when that happens, I know that uh, India will be a positive influence upon Russia. So if there's a conversation on Russia, China is something that will be discussed. Uh, with China, we, you know that the relationship with India has gone down because of what has happened, the Chinese aggressiveness at the line of actual control. How do you see the Chinese actions in the Indo-Pacific and how do you see the Indo-Pacific vision as well? What is your country doing to further this vision or do you support this vision? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, clearly one of the um, most uh, remarkable aspects of the changing in the geopolitical landscape in the last uh, couple of decades has been the rise of China. Historically, uh, this uh, tends to lead to friction and we are seeing this currently in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. What we would like is not to negate the rise of China. This is uh, historical inevitability, just as the rise of India is, but to ensure that it happens in a manner that is peaceful and uh, that, is, that provides stability rather than instability and unpredictability. We have been uh, disappointed to hear China repeats a false narrative produced by Russia about somehow Russia's invasion of Ukraine being the fault of, uh, of NATO. This has been frankly very disappointing and uh, we think that it may well be related to the fact that Russia has been increasingly, as a result of this, um, in need of having a lifeline thrown to it by, by China. Russia's clearly weakened itself politically, economically, and it needs Chinese uh, support. Now, uh, I think that the greatest contribution that China could make to the international order would be to not to embrace this Russian narrative, but on the contrary, to say that uh, you know, we are also in favor of stability and therefore we cannot be in favor of this process. Currently, with the support given uh, at the moment, uh, at least at the narrative level, we hope it goes no further than that, uh, by China to Russia, then this is uh, a very negative indication for the Indo-Pacific region. So as Europeans, we are very much uh, concerned with this approach by China. So my last question to you is, uh, Portugal played an important role when it comes to India, European Union relationship. Uh, you proposed the summit level conversations uh, way back in 2000s. Uh, now, how do you see this relationship going forward? And especially on the free trade agreement, this has been languishing for a pretty long time. What can be done so that this can see uh, the day of the light? Well, a couple of points. The first, to, to, to underline that you are very, very right to say that Portugal has always used its position and sometimes its rotating presidency of the European Union to promote Indo-EU relations. We, uh, in the time of Manmohan Singh, had the, the first uh, summit relationship. This time it's the first uh, meeting this last year in Portuguese presidency of the European Union, the first meeting between Prime Minister Modi and all 27 uh, member states of the European Union. So that was a, a landmark. We need now that this landmark uh, be translated into, uh, amongst other things, uh, the free trade agreement. The sense that I have at the moment is that we actually all have very positive expectations about the free trade agreement. I, I've known these negotiations well over many years and they've always been bogged down in the details. At the moment, the challenge and the awareness that we both have on, on, on either side 
is that this is more than simply about trade. This is a strategic relationship. It's important for us to go beyond the bean counting, the uh, uh, looking at the uh, intricate details of trade agreements, and to see the wider picture. And the wider picture is of an evolving world in which the European Union and India need each other and can benefit greatly from the strong understanding uh, that is created by a free trade agreement. So I believe that at the, mo the current time we have the best possible circumstances and we need to have the determination, the ambition and the capacity to stick with the difficulties, to go overcome them, uh, that will allow us to conclude a free trade agreement. And so before I leave you, uh, the diaspora connect is still there between the two countries. Your uh, Prime Minister had the Indian links with Goa, how do you see the role played by this link in terms of the relationship? Well, it's a very strong one. And I, I would say that it's strong uh, in two manners. Firstly, uh, historically, it's very present. Uh, India is not a, an unknown country for Portuguese. India is a country that is part of our history, uh, of our own way of seeing ourselves in the world. And of course, it is the home for an important uh, community living in Portugal. Uh, the other aspect that is very interesting is that we've uh, recently signed a migration and mobility agreement between Portugal and India and what we're looking forward to is a strengthening of the Indian community in Portugal in, in terms of uh, numbers, bringing it up to date, making it based not only upon the historical uh, heritage of families that uh, have uh, come many years ago, but uh, based, making it very up to date and uh, based on current uh, realities between our countries. And so I think that uh, at the end of the day, the people to people links are the most important ones. These are the ones upon which a relationship between countries can flourish. So we're very keen to create the best possible circumstances for that. Well, thank you so much, sir, for speaking to Viola. And perhaps we'll see more high level visit in India and from India to your country. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.